Now on BBC Two, Bully for Michael Moore. Meet my bully, Debbie Kelly, from high school. Oh, oh. It's Bully Reunion Night here on TV Nation. All right, damn it, stop it. Ah. In this country, what are the things you need a license for? Um, driving. To buy a gun. How about hunting? I guess if you want to sell liquor. How about watching TV? Watching TV? No, anybody could watch whatever they dang well please, I guess. Yeah, well, over in Great Britain, you can't. You have to go to the government, get a license. You have to pay for a license just for the privilege of watching television. Get out of here. No, in order to watch TV, just to watch it. I'd be in jail for life. We sent our reporter, Jeff Stilson, over to the UK to find out why it is you have to get a license to watch free TV. I'd like to know that. Well, let's watch. Hail Great Britain, cradle of civilized society, home of Shakespeare, the Queen, and TV licenses? I was amazed to find out that unlike the United States where the airwaves are free, you Brits have to have a license from the government to own a television set. Cashing out £86.50 each year for the right to own a TV seemed weird. I couldn't imagine how anyone could hope to enforce this strange law. But then I met Ivan and Andy, TV license officers. Their mission? To make sure everyone with a TV has a license to watch it. You move the aerial to the um, direction that we suspect the television, and by picking up a signal on the, um, the graph here, we can actually locate within a couple of feet the location of the television. It isn't easy catching people watching TV without a license. You have to be prepared. I'll get the visits off the area manager, make sure I've got 178. I've got my ID card, I have the envelopes, make sure I've got sufficient pens, make sure I drink me coffee and um, put that away, and then uh, basically I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go out. Yeah. Yes, it's quite a strong signal. It's though. not as glamorous as it looks. TV cheats are everywhere, and they can be pretty tough characters. He said, uh, according to our com uh, system, uh, uh, computer, you don't have a TV license. And I says, no. And he says, do you have a television set? And I said, yeah. Yvette is a mother of four who was at home sick when she was caught doing some flagrant, unlicensed viewing. Well, he says, you, you, you'll be prosecuted. 63% of those cited for not having a license are women, and many of them, like Yvette, are unemployed mothers. So if you don't pay a television license fee, then you're, you're considered a, a criminal. You're considered to be breaking the law. I made a few payments, and I think it was the week before Christmas, and I couldn't afford to send any more. And um, a, a warrant was issued for my arrest. Now, I always thought the airwaves were free. Well, basically they are, but in fact, the right to use the airwaves, the, the government, I mean, there is a government regulation that actually says that, in fact, to use the airwaves, you have to have a license. And if you don't, you can expect a visit from Ivan and Andy, TV license officers. <laughs> How did you manage to find me? I made sure you weren't able to pick up my signal. See, I told you, Frank. Well, a fluke, a fluke. Why risk it? With every address on our central computer, it's only a matter of time before we catch you. And then you could be watching horror. If they catch you, you'll pay a fine of up to a thousand pounds. And if you can't pay the fine, you may end up watching TV in jail. So this is your first offense, and you had to go to prison for it? Yes. Did you have your own cell or? No, I was in a cell. 
when the, with someone who was a, a drug addict. It was uh, terrible what they did to me. But I was very innocent and I didn't know what to expect when I was going there. Um, it was very upsetting for us all. It was humiliating, um, degrading. I can't understand why they sent me there. I, I never, never expected that. Never. Do you find it absurd that uh, someone who doesn't pay their television license fee can end up in a prison cell next to someone who has been charged with murder? Well, I think <clears throat> they're unlikely to end up in the same prison, let alone in adjoining cells. Obviously, a fine defaulter may find herself next to somebody being charged with quite a serious offence. Like? Um, well, it could be murder. There was one there next door to me, attempted murderer, um, murderers, arsonists. Prostitution, um, shoplifting, assault. Absurd or not, 300 women are sent to prison each year for failing to pay TV license funds. Women serving hard time for owning a TV. Hey, you better stop them before they watch again. It's all in a day's work for Ivan and Andy, TV license officers. Right, switch this on. Now I can select from this, pressing in the channel, and I'll start the house marker very. A lot of quiz programs are on, very, very popular. I press that again, and I get a recording of what I've been picking up. When Andy and Ivan get rolling in their detectomobile, no TV cheat can breathe safely, even if they're living near someone else's TV. Whose television set is it? Mine. And Julie received a fine? For... Julie was fined and taken to court for a television set which didn't belong to her. They just didn't want to listen. They just wanted to make an example of her because so many people now have, cannot afford a TV license. I know it's wrong. I'm not standing here saying uh, it's OK not to have your telly on and not have a license. But I, I don't think I should have been sent to prison for it as a punishment. It seems a bit severe for just watching the TV. Well, it's a matter for government, not for the BBC. Um, basically, our job is, in fact, to, to act within the law, not to decide the law. I think we basically take the view it's a matter for the BBC, and they've got to have some mechanism for enforcing the licence fee system. I'm a great believer that this country on the whole is a very civilised country. Uh, we've got a very good legal tradition, and I want to see people treated justly. And I think the notion of locking women up um, for not paying their television licenses, I think most people would, would feel sort of almost naturally that there's something a bit wrong with that. We should have a better way of dealing with this problem. Whatever the concerns of prison governors, two men stand between freedom and the anarchy of unlicensed viewing. Ivan and Andy, TV license officers. Hear that knock at your door? Quick, hide the TV. Yes, this one, the one my voice is coming out of. Hurry, before it's too late. That's right. Tonight, our correspondents meet up with the bullies who used to push them around. It's Bully Reunion Night on TV Nation. My bully from school was Debbie Kelly. Our fellow classmates elected me class clown and elected her class grouch. When we flew her in for Bully Reunion Night, she brought me a present from home. Hello, Michael. Oh. Donuts from the home bakery. Mmm, good. I remember walking down the hallway with my books. I was carrying my books like this. And you came up to me and you said, hey, man, you're carrying them like a girl. Guys carry them like this under their arm, you know? So, like, for the next week to compensate, I just kept walking through the halls like this. <laughs> the macho look. You know, trying to, like, get my guyness back. Every one of these students, our eighth grade class is on here but me, signing her photo. You don't remember. You said, may I sign your photo? And I said, for a kiss, you turned around, grabbed your books, and you ran. <laughs> Is that what happened? You ran. I knew which ones to pick on. You would blush, and you would grab your books, and you would run in the other direction. And that was a real fun thing for me. You had right, the right exact thing to say. I just wanted to go crawl away. And... Well, maybe it's like I had a secret crush on you or something, and I was trying to get your attention. Uh, yeah, see, I, yeah, maybe that's it. I thought it'd be a good idea maybe if we went on a little boat ride around Central Park here. How about you row and... Uh, well, if I don't want to row? On the count of three. All right. This is the thought. Loser rows. You got it? Okay. One, two, three. Whoa! Ah! Piece of Wait, cake. Wait, now try it even. Ready? You got any more little... Oh, excuse me. No, I'm ready. Watch the nails. All right. You tell me when you're ready. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Stop! Two out of three. <laughs> Out, in, together, together. Okay, okay, I'm trying to row. I'm trying to row. Ah! Beg, Stop. Michael, beg! Stop. Oh, Stop. there we go. No! <laughs> Somebody help! Where's the crew? I'll let you up if you give me a kiss. <laughs> and I'm just shocked to think that maybe I hurt your feelings at some time or another, or that you even felt this way about me. I just, I'm surprised. I do feel sad, I do, you know. You feel bad? Yeah, huh? I do. But it's nice that you care. Oh, thanks, Debbie. <laughs> Forty percent of Americans remember exactly where they were when JFK, the movie, was shot. I'm Catholic. So am I. Are you really? Yes. Yeah. So you know all about confession, right? Yes. Yeah. And and what's the worst penance that a priest ever gave you? Ooh. Three Our Fathers and two Hail Marys. Hail Marys and Our Fathers. Probably a couple of Hail Marys. That was about it. Uh, the Rosary, like seventeen times at the 17 altar. Seventeen Rosaries. Yeah, For yeah. what sin? Uh, I, talking back or chewing gum or doing well, something see, really Now, I only got one Hail Mary for that sin. That's the problem. There's no standard sentencing in the Catholic Church. True. You know, you go to one priest, you get that. I go to another, I get what I got, you know. Well, I decided to send our fellow Catholic correspondent, Janine Garofalo, to a number of area churches to find out what kinds of penances they were giving out for the same sin and then report back to us. I'd like to know what church you went to. It's useful information, huh? Yeah. Well, watch this. I like the way many religions around the world atone for their sins. You can beat yourself, pray waist deep in the Ganges, or face a wall and wail. But in my religion, Catholicism, atonement for sin is not so easy. We have confession. Before starting her confession survey, we chatted with Janine to check her religious credentials. Well, was your family very religious? Yeah, um, as a matter of fact, my grandmother for many years worked for the Archdiocese of New York. She was a secretary for Cardinal Spellman and Cardinal O'Connor. I used to pray every night before bed and I went to sleep with my hand on a Bible under my pillow. What's your confirmation name? Christine. Christine. Now why Christine? Because I like the name Chrissy. I just thought I had a real kicky spirit to it, Chrissy because I didn't like Janine Garofalo. I liked the name either Chrissy or Bonnie. What was your first confession like? It was really scary. I was really, in, I giggled through the whole thing and um, I didn't have anything to sin at that time, you know, except like stealing a pencil or, did you, you know, find, Did you find yourself making up sins? Yeah. Janine accepted the assignment and headed off to confess her sins at a number of New York area churches. But because I'm Catholic and still believe in the fires of hell, I wanted to compile an honest survey. So each time Janine went to confession, she had to confess an actual sin. Father, forgive me. It's been a long time since my last confession. And um, I wanted to confess that I'm still attracted to other men. You know, I think of them in sexual terms. He was really nice and he told me that uh, it was normal and just not to act on it. And, and I have to say three are fathers in the name of uh, the homeless and drug addicted of the city. Since Janine had to confess a real sin each time, I needed to ensure a steady supply of impure thoughts. So I hired male model Kai Dahl to ride around with Janine and provide the temptation. Father, I think I'm a serial monogamist in my head. Is that bad? What was the penance this time? Two Hail Marys after con act of contrition and pray for the hungry. Father, I've been having dirty thoughts about men. Father, 
father, I've got a little bit of love and a whole lot of lust. Act of contrition, three Hail Marys, pray for the homeless. Father, I can't stop thinking about the opposite sex. That would be men. Jenny, what was the penance this time? Reading the book of Genesis. With all of these penances to perform, Janine started to have some serious questions about what was at stake. So we found someone to speak with her outside the confessional. Father, thank you so much for talking to me. Now, my child, I am not a priest, but I play a priest on Broadway and on television. Oh. And I'm Irish. Oh, great. <laughs> Sin is like having mice. If you think you have them, you do. You need to pray. Um, as they say, take cold showers. Um, the description of hell is demons going about, poking people with uh, forks and spears, mm -hmm. and that you can't even lift your hand to take a worm that may be crawling into your eye. So it's perfectly all right to be afraid of hell. You know what I think hell is? What? Um, it's a bunch of Stairmasters. They're all at the Department of Motor Vehicles, and the only music you get is karaoke style. It was time now to compile the list of penances with our own certified public accountant. 36 Hail Marys. And it looks like you've got 26 Our Fathers. And it looks to me like the most severe of these are Sacred Heart gave you 15 Hail Marys, and uh, St. Raphael's gave you 10 Our Fathers. And then at St. Margaret, you um, have to read a chapter of Genesis. Somebody at St. Joseph said, see a counselor. And I think that would be at least six months at uh, $80 a week for the period of 26 weeks. That gives us uh, mm -hmm, uh, $2,080 is what that would cost. Is that deductible? Uh, sure, if you exceed 7.5% of your gross income. The only thing left was for Janine to get rid of the temptation and do her penances. Hail Mary, full grace, source with thee, blessed are the There's one in Jesus, Holy Mary, Mother of God, patient nurse, now at the hour of death. Amen. Hail Mary, full grace, source with thee, blessed are the one in There's one in Jesus, Holy Mary, Mother of God, patient nurse, now at the hour of death. Amen. The proceeding was a reenactment. All the churches and penances, though, were real. The participants were bona fide Roman Catholics who believe in the pains of hell and the existence of a merciful God. No actual commandments were broken during this broadcast. It's Bully Reunion Night on TV Nation, where we reunite our correspondents with the bullies who used to beat them up. My bully was a boy called David Neviaski. We were at boarding school in London together. When I was 13 and David was about 16, he used to terrorize me. Lately, I'd heard an incredible rumor about David, that he now lived on a Buddhist monastery in Scotland. I went to try to find him. There he is. He doesn't look as scary as he used to. The abbot told me David had been at the monastery five years. Well, I think he's sort of, uh, in a way, quite uh, tough, isn't it? He's tough, isn't yes, he? He's yeah. tough, yes, he's tough. He's tough. Yes. But what happens now, we call, if it's properly guided, the toughness is transformed into a positive. Is it? Yeah, I think so. Is so. David a good monk? Well, I think he's trying to do his very best. David, all right. How's it going? All right. Yeah. You know him well. Well, yeah, we were at school together. I see. I'd written a list of mean things I remember David doing at school. He's in your head ringing a bell. I still play smoke on the water. No, you don't. <laughs> the hot chocolate one, do you remember oh that one? Oh, God, I don't remember that. Wow, that's quite some document. It's scary, isn't it? Well, you can't no, read no. the rest. Wait, 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 wait. No, wait. this is my film. This is my film. You've come to see me. You can take the questions. Wow, what is the sound of one hand clapping? I learned that the other night. What's, what is the sound? Cap! Call me paranoid, but I got the feeling David really did want to hit me. Jeez, I thought you were going to bully me again there. 
Instead of stealing my hot chocolate, he was pouring me tea. That was progress. That's traditional Tibetan tea, yeah? Earl Grey. What can I say, you know? Enjoy yourself, yeah. Is yeah. that what it's about? I think so, yeah, as long as you don't hurt anyone in the process, yeah. I like David the monk a bit better than David the bully. I looked forward to seeing him after another five years at the monastery. All right, cheers, Dave. Yeah, right, yeah. Back in the 80s here in America, there were a group of banks known as the Savings and Loans that went bankrupt because their executives looted the vaults. Now, you would think that when something like that happens, those executives would have a price to pay. Well, if you thought that, you'd be wrong. Take a look at a piece our American network would not allow us to air. Savings and loans are American banking institutions that for decades were regulated by the U.S. government. It means help for housing. But then, in 1984, President Reagan got rid of a lot of regulations and allowed savings and loans to make riskier investments. All in all, I think we hit the jackpot. And the fun began. A lot of buildings went up, and some people made a lot of money. <laughs> of course, there was a downside, too. It's been called the biggest bank scandal ever. The government said billions have been squandered. It turned out that some of the people in charge were making bad loans and exaggerating the value of their assets. Some were charged. I was charged uh, uh, with negligence. With having an overvalued financial state. For negligence in operating the institution. Sale of securities to investors. Uh, improperly. Now I'm proud to sign this monster. Savings and loans ended up $500 billion in the hole, and the government came to the rescue. Each taxpayer now pays dearly as a result of bankers gone berserk. But at least the bankers responsible got punished, right? Well... It's not whether you win or lose, it's whether you have a good time. I'm having a great time. <laughs> Take Neil Bush. Neil was director of Silverado Savings and Loan. Among other things, he helped approve a $900,000 loan to a friend. That friend just happened to be Neil's business partner, and that's not allowed. When Silverado folded, Neil faced a $29 million penalty. But thanks to his father, President George Bush, the American people put up a billion dollars to pay for his mistake. I learned everything I know from my dad. <laughs> Thomas Spiegel ran Columbia Savings and Loan in Beverly Hills. The bank lost $1.2 billion, and the government wanted him to pay back $40 million. But Spiegel ended up paying less than 1% of what he lost. That's why he can afford a house like this, a country club like this, and meals at a restaurant like this. Oh, yeah, Tom Spiegel came here, you know, say three, four, five times a, uh, a week. Bum Bright's Republic Bank flopped, and he paid $102 million in fines. Still, that's not as bad as the $3.6 billion it cost Americans. And just look at Bum now. He owns a trucking company, an oil business, and his own town. Last year, he made millions. Craig Hall paid $102 million in fines. But that's just chump change to a high roller like him. Even though he damaged both Resource Savings and Hall Savings Association, he was able to raise $100 million, and now he's back in business. For me, it's, it's fun and it's a challenge, and, and that's what I've been all about since a very young age. I've never wanted overly lavish living standards. Congressman Henry Hyde used to supervise savings and loans in the U.S. Congress, but that was too boring. So he became an SNL director at Clyde Federal Savings. Sadly, his SNL tank and Hyde was charged. No big deal. He became chairman of the House Judiciary Committee anyway. But it's not always easy being a fat cat. I felt sick. I just felt terribly alone. This is a major nuisance. They actually walked in and took the company from us. Very. Uh, distressing. I just got angry. 
Not everyone broke the law, but 50 former SNL operators formed their own support group. I know you must feel like um, you've been hit in the back of the head with a two-by-four. I felt uh, the need to join because of frustration. Tremendous human tragedies. I'm not the same kind of judgmental guy I used to be. I've developed some great friends from this. I realize that, that I'm not alone in this. At least they've got each other. It's not easy to live with blame. But making a lot of money helps. I'm a convicted felon. And I'm still doing business, and my firm is doing well. I'm gratified that I can still work and earn some money. My lawyers are happy too. <laughs> For him, the savings and loan crisis is a done deal. For the rest of the country, it's unfinished business. Americans have already spent $500 billion to rescue all the failed SNLs, but it'll cost another $500 billion before the bailout's done. Still, it's worth a trillion dollars to make a bunch of businessmen happy again. Everyone knows that getting a second chance is what America is all about if you're rich. It's Bully Reunion Night on TV Nation. I was waiting for the guy who made my life miserable when I was a kid, Anthony Crunkleton. Every single Sunday after church, Anthony would be right there to beat me up and make fun of my white shoes. I have to give you the complimentary gum. Uh, welcome to New York. This is the trick. No, man, it's friendship time. <laughs> I said it was friendship time, but that didn't mean I was ready to give Anthony a free ride. So I made him do all the pedaling. I haven't rode a bicycle since that last time I chased you on one. Making Anthony sweat was sort of fun. Yet, I had a plan. See, I think the thing is, Anthony, that all your life you've wanted a pair of white shoes like those white shoes that I had. You were teasing me about the white shoes because deep down inside, you jealous. wanted a pair of white shoes. So this should psychologically and mentally free you. Give me these. I can do it <laughs> myself. Great. I think those are the ones. We even now, pal. Not quite. I paid for Anthony to have a private lesson. A hundred bucks should do the trick. Let me take care of it. You have a seat. Now, there's an impact or shock technique first. That's when we do the ab work, right? So it's a shock technique, then we grab the hand technique. Right? I'm not sure I understood the shock technique. Oh, right? up. Ah. Ah. Pull and over. Pull. Could I Enough. see that again? Over. All right. This bully stuff sure had a lot going for it, but it was time for both of us to grow up. Yeah, at last. Put it here, pal. My bullying days are over. <laughs> Thirty-two percent of Americans who think of themselves as smarter than average say they support the militia movement. Two entertainment giants, the Walt Disney Company and ABC, announce they are joining forces. Economics correspondent... This is the biggest deal in entertainment history. A deal as... And that's why QVC and Viacom spent months in a major bidding war to gain control. Look at that. It doesn't matter what channel you turn to. There's another media merger. ...are preparing to dominate TV and movie screens worldwide. It seems like fewer and fewer people are controlling our news. Media monopolies? Oh, Mike. I've heard a lot about them on my corporate crime-fighting tour across America. The uh, mass media mergers that are occurring across the uh, country... The paper that was squashed was the Cleveland Press. We lost two editorial voices. We put a lot of reporters to columnists out on the street. What you got to do, Crackers, is watch out for other cities where this is happening. Like Detroit. Detroit, Detroit that's my home turf. Wow, they used to have two papers there, separate and competing, a liberal one and a conservative one. And what happened? Six years ago, the federal government let them merge their operations, and now they split the profits. Is that legal? I'm afraid so, Mike. Used to be that nearly every city in America had two or more competing daily newspapers. Now, there are only 13 cities left. Well, it's not good in a democracy to have fewer voices for the people. It's for the birds, if you ask me. Well, Crackers, I think there's only one thing we can do. To Detroit! 
When we got to Detroit, we discovered that the company which operates the city's two newspapers had forced a strike, throwing thousands of people out of work. Faster than a pink slip from management! More powerful than the local police! Able to leap! Well, able to leap! It's a bird! It's a bird! It's Crackers, the corporate crime fighting chicken! Last Thursday, my boss called me and said if I don't cross the picket line and step over my family and my friends and my co-workers, I'm going to lose my job. That company, after everything I've given to that company, they gave me the bird. Well, I'm giving them the bird back right here. Two competing newspapers are always better than one. That's why Crackers and I set out to demand that Detroit's papers break up their monopoly immediately. With his superhero strength, Crackers forced open the locked security doors. This is the corporate crime fighting chicken. I want to speak to someone. We came with a gift we knew they'd appreciate. The news was trying to shut the door on us again, so Crackers decided to reason with them. Hey, who's gonna hurt a chicken? That was the first time our chicken had flown on national TV. Undaunted, I sent Crackers to the labor negotiations across town to confront newspaper management. His mission? Return Detroit to a two-newspaper town. Hey, newspaper management people, can I speak to you? As newspaper people, you must understand the need to get both sides of the story. Can we just ask you a few questions? Will you not respond? Can you hear me? Hey, didn't I tell you to get, get out of here? You guys are going to have to leave the, the area. Especially you. We're not going to make a circus out of this now. I'm asking you guys to leave. Is it something you have against chickens? No, I have nothing against chickens. It's just no costumes like this are going to clutter up our negotiation. So please leave. I need a mediator to deal with the mediator. Apparently, these newspaper guys didn't like reporters. There was only one thing left to do. Break that monopoly once and for all. I'm going to start a newspaper. So he set out to report on what was happening in Detroit. Well, I'll tell you what's happening here for sure. Any stories going on here? We deal with a lot of emotions. Just the facts. But we don't have any freezers or anything. <laughs> no, no freezers. Hey, what's the scoop? It's a big bird. Can I call you on that? Ooh. Court's adjourned. Having gotten the facts, Crackers went to a union plant to design, lay out, and print the first edition of the Crackers Free Press. Yes! Now it was time to get the paper to the people. Extra, extra, extra! Hey, Crackers Free Press here. Get your Crackers Free Press. Thank you, Crackers. I find my papers in the bushes all the time. Hi. See, I got this tip about corporate crime. Here's one for the publisher. Here's one for the corporate uh, honchos down in Florida or wherever they are. Here's all for a couple of stock owners as well, you know. Here, there's a lot of you in that company. Paperboy, it's a good read. It's a competing newspaper. Can you please leave, you're trespassing. Okay, don't want to do that, just want to get my job done. Okay, back Go. off. Thank you. A paperboy can't deliver a newspaper to a publisher's house? Is he afraid of the competition? This monopoly business has gone far enough. I met up with Crackers, and we went to see Detroit Congressman John Conyers, who talked to us about newspaper monopolies. And they're making record, mm -hmm. record profits. You're the senior Democratic member on the Judiciary Committee. You're the ranking member. What can you do? Crackers, we can, in the Judiciary Committee that has jurisdiction over these kinds of problems of uh, monopolies, 
of union busting tactics. What we want to do is whole oversight hearings. So you'll and, actually and you'll actually ask for these oversight hearings. I'm, I'm going to request as the the senior demand. member of judiciary. You're going to demand. Uh, all right, I'll I'll even demand it. This is the first time on national television that I've said to anybody, including an animal, that uh, th we ought to have these oversight hearings on the joint operating agreements. Well, Congressman, this is an incredible offer that you've made to crackers here. Sure. And a commitment to to our crime-fighting chicken. Well, I've never been interviewed by a, a, a chicken that, huh. of any size before. Thanks to Crackers, look for congressional hearings this fall on the Newspaper Preservation Act, which allows these legalized monopolies to occur. As it is now, there are only 13 cities in the whole country that have truly competing dailies operated by separate companies. Well, make that 14 cities. And now, more of TV Nation's Bully Reunion Night. In seventh grade, I had the first teacher who wouldn't let me talk my way out of a jam, Sister Janetta. She was tough. And even today, the thought of seeing her again has me a little scared. I couldn't find my seventh grade uniform. I hope she'd recognize me anyway. Karen. Hi, Hi, Sister Janetta. How are you? Oh, good. Hi. Good so to see years. you. Right. Yeah. Oh, I would have recognized you anywhere. I would too. No, I can't even remember. <laughs> I see the little girl next to the board there, maybe the second row yeah. towards the end. <laughs> kind of hiding from you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I'd show Sister Janetta one of the places where I'd played hooky. So what do you think? You think I'd make a good nun? Oh, sure. Yeah? It's not too late? Never too late. Some people are smoking pot over here. Where? Right here on the left. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. How would you know that? <laughs> sister Janetta could still catch me, just like the old days. I took the sister on a nostalgic field trip to the Liberty Science Center. I remember spending more time in the hall. You never really had the ruler. You know, you never, no, you never were the ruler. No, well, because you were the ruler. <laughs> it was a wholesome fear. <laughs> yeah, a wholesome fear. Well, all the models here, the I know, visible look at that, man. the visible right. man, the pumping heart, the right. eye. Right here. Brain and skull. Now, what were you like as a kid? I, I, was, a, I was a little nasty kid, you know, <laughs> beating up all the kids on the block. <laughs> well, give you a good training to be a nun. I have something for you. <laughs> oh, isn't that interesting? A nun. Let's see what I could do with it. Twelve years of Catholic school. Oh, what a long reach you have. I know. I'll just keep my guard and uh, make sure you don't give me an uppercut here. You think this would be a hit at the convict? I sure do. You can I give me your all these one Karen and the other Janetta. <laughs> We'd evened up the score, but I still had one more question. Do you ever regret those pop math quizzes that you used to give? No. Okay, what's 2 times 18 minus 4? Four. And that oh, was come on, what's 2 times 18 minus 4? Well, 36 minus 4 is 32. I gave you an easy one. <laughs> I'm still a little afraid of you, Sister Janetta. No, <laughs> Karen. No. So. I've mellowed in the years, too, you know. When I say the Democratic Party, what does it do for you? Uh, not much. But it seemed like the Democratic Party was always supposed to be the party of the people. You know, it's probably supposed to be, but it didn't end up that what way. What happened? And then what are they? Where are they at today? I don't know. I don't. Nobody know. knows. Nobody knows. Where Nobody knows. Are. So I decided to send our KGB agent Yuri Chavetz on a mission to find the heart and soul of the Democratic Party. That'll be interesting. Well, let's watch. Yuri, this is your mission. Something strange has happened to the Democratic Party. Three years ago, they won the White House and both houses of Congress. Now they're losing it all. Your mission is to find out what happened to the Democrats and how they can regain their lost soul. I had my mission and I knew what to do. I learned the Democratic National Committee was meeting in New Orleans, Louisiana. I assumed the identity of a foreign journalist so I could infiltrate the inner circle of the party. 
But the people did not seem to be doing much planning about how to turn the country around. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. In my country, we knew how to throw a real party congress. Nonetheless, I found that higher placed party leaders were very willing to talk to me. Why should I join the Democratic Party now? If you're selfish, be a Republican. If you're a patriot, be a Democrat. Thank, Thank you. Very you. Much. What did he mean by this? I needed answers from the party boss. Good afternoon and welcome to New Orleans. I was surprised that the auditorium was not full for the president's videotaped address to the party faithful. In my country, there would be consequences for such an absence. If you don't know right now why you're a Democrat as we head toward the 21st century, I don't think you'll ever know. What an incredible thing to say to members of your own party. With an attitude like this, it's no wonder that the Democrats have lost their traditional base of women, working people and minorities. In my country, when you lose touch with the people, what happens is not a pretty sight. Everywhere I went, the Democrats were sounding more like Republicans. No one has cut more from the federal budget than the president and the Democratic Party. Cut the budget? We must never, ever be afraid to talk about family values. Family values? My counsel to you tonight is, is to act like a Republican. Act like a Republican? This is the Democrats' problem. The Republicans already have a party. It's called the Republican Party. No wonder 60% of the American public doesn't vote. Michael. As a result of my trip to the Democratic National Committee, I can now make to you the following recommendations. Number one, President Clinton must start acting like a man. I still don't want to do that, but I will if I have to. Number two, the Democrats must never again use a theme song by Fleetfoot Mac. I hate this band. Finally. I believe that President Clinton should stop jogging with people like Baywatch star David Hasselhoff and should spend more time jogging with people who can get him back in touch with his democratic roots. Only then can he avoid his fate. Well, we've managed to get through bully night without having to mention those uh, BBC executives who are breathing down my neck all the time. <laughs> Just a little joke. Uh, next week, we'll be back here with our last episode of this season, so be sure and tune in then to Michael Moore's TV Nation. And Michael Moore is back next Monday here on BBC Two.